Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mindset RX series of the Alpha Movement Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and I work with functional athletes to build them the champ's mindset. These podcasts highlight the methods I teach the athletes I work with and allow you to pick up the scalable, learnable mindset lessons from the best in functional fitness. I'm honored today to bring you Carl Powley. On the surface, Carl has created a system for enhancing movement in an extremely elegant fashion. And by the way, that's no no short task there. Scratch the surface though, and you find a deep thinker with a knack for obtuse in a good way, thought processes, and a man whose deep care is just incredible to behold. What's more, we cover extremely mentally challenging phases Carl has been through and how, is he, how he has dealt with them. When you see someone with Carl's reputation, I think you consider them infallible. So it's important to see, firstly, that these things can happen to anyone, and secondly, that there is a way out of this pattern of thinking. A few bits of housekeeping before we get started, though. Firstly, this podcast is growing rapidly, and I'm going to ask you a favor, pretty, pretty please. Could you head over to iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast and leave the show a five-star review? It would mean the world to me, and it will also help important episodes like this one reach more people number two i wrote an article on how to mentally attack any and every word your competition and uh, sorry your box or a competition can throw at you it's information i've never spoken about before and if you're a competitive athlete this is for you so you can read that at mindsetrx.com slash blog slash the arch Three, if you enjoyed this more personal style of podcast interview, I'd love to hear about it. And you can find me on all of the socials like Instagram and Facebook and let me know. Not Twitter though, because Twitter is bullshit. And four, I understand these podcasts have become rather sporadic in timing. And the, like, the truth is I felt I was putting out content just for marketing purposes. And I realized this approach is bullshit for a few reasons or many reasons. But because of that, I've decided to concentrate on producing evergreen pieces that take longer to create but will be much more valuable to you. So like the article I mentioned above and this podcast episode, they took longer to produce but have a ton more valuable advice. The idea is they'll help you more directly. So if you find value in these shows, please share them. And now I bring you, admittedly with a couple of audio glitches, a wide-ranging and thoughtful pro... um, I was doing so well. Spoke all of that without any glitches or or fuck-ups in there. Now I bring you, admittedly with a couple of audio glitches, a wide-ranging and thought-provoking conversation with the phenom that is Carl Pauli. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm excited to be here. No worries. No worries. It's, um, I mean, I've been so excited to talk to you for such a long time, and I'm super happy. It's like calendars have aligned and um, been able to do some good research on you as well, so it's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was thoroughly impressed uh, with your uh, pre-interview interview and and the research that you've been doing, so it's uh, it's awesome. I I appreciate it and I respect it. I'd like to say it was uh, an intelligent move. It's laziness, really. <laughs> it works okay. better. <laughs> no, I'm okay, joking. Okay. I'm joking. Um, so, I think the the interesting place to start is you must have been through how you got into gymnastics so many times. Um, what was the end of gymnastics like? It was confusing. Uh, that's, that's the only word I can really find. Um, as it was one of those moments in my life where I really wondered uh, what my self-worth really was. And, and I asked myself why, if I set out to do something like going to the Olympics, for example, which was one of my goals, uh, and I put in all the hours, all the training, and... I quote unquote did all the right things. Why didn't I make it? Uh, there must be something wrong with me, something that's not right. Um, but somehow I managed to like sweep that under the rug a little bit, and I just put my focus, laser attention on other things like school, and I, I started environmental science and, and got into genetic engineering, and then marine biology, and. Um, I basically put all my effort that I was putting into being an athlete into being uh, a, a mental athlete and an intellectual athlete, uh, uh, a businessman athlete, a business athlete. <laughs> uh, and I think that transition was, was tough. And in a way, 
is still going on. You realize that that ending of a career, quote unquote, uh, was going to be the tone and the struggle of the rest of your life. And as hard as it was to leave gymnastics, it was also the best time of my life. So I'm currently living that same thing. It's the toughest it's ever been, but the best it's ever been. Do you mind talking about how that, 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 the, um, the leaving of gymnastics came about? Yeah, it, when I was 16, uh, of course, uh, teenager, I was, um, I was very frustrated. I, I felt like I wasn't progressing as fast as I could. And uh, I was starting to get nagging injuries in terms of just stress. Elbows were messed up. My traps were messed up. I had one major uh, injury, which was I, I fractured my, my neck. That had me out for eight months. Uh, and then that kind of just progressively kept on piling on until I was 19. And when I was uh, 19... I realized that um, this this wasn't really changing, and I didn't have the tools to be able to make the shift, the conscious shift uh, towards whatever it is that I I needed to go towards in order to get to the Olympics. And and I think that was that was a that was the biggest struggle. Uh, and kind of to go back to your your question. Uh, it, it's, it, it was the most confusing time in my life, put it that way. And, and to be able to look back now at that time, it's almost like uh, uh, you, you ask yourself, did, did I do everything in my power to, to achieve the, the goal? And, and uh, the answer is, is, is yes. Uh, yes, with what I had at that time. Uh, if I could go back in time with what I know now, maybe the story would be a little different. Maybe I wouldn't even have chosen to do gymnastics. Mm-hmm. So why did you choose to do gymnastics? I chose to do gymnastics because my mom put me into gymnastics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a story you hear the whole time. Um, and it ha- always has mixed results. Why? Well, do you reckon? Do you reckon it ended well? Yeah, for sure. Okay, for sure. I, I ended up. Uh, my my last competition was in uh, a city called Granada in Spain, southern Spain. Uh, I ended up becoming uh, national champion in vault. So I was, you know, I stood on the on the podium at the top with a medal, uh, and I. Uh, took fourth overall, which was not bad. That that qualified me for the national team and the next year and the whole thing. Um, but I was I was consciously ready to to say goodbye, and uh, that was my my last last competition. And I remember even uh, I, I got drug tested right after the competition, and uh, I was sitting there, and, and they're like, "Oh, this is your last competition. You should have a beer as your." <laughs> you know, trying trying to get ready to go pee <laughs> in this cup, and uh, I was like, "No, nah, I I don't drink." And they're like, "You're not going to celebrate? This is your last?" I was like, "This is the celebration. It, it it was awesome." And then after that, my family and friends were there, and we hung out for the weekend, and and then it was over. Was there a particular event that triggered you to stop? Uh. Not an event, but it was this almost lack of commitment of the team. There was the, the culture of the team started to crumble. And it wasn't because we didn't want to be the best. It was more so the, the outside struggles and pressures uh, of, of politics and finances within the team were, were hurting uh, our, our practices and our relationships and the consistency in our training and our equipment was breaking down and we had to travel very long distances to just get access to certain equipment like a foam pit you're coming out of a high bar or the rings and there were certain elements we couldn't practice on a daily basis that brought our confidence down it was just uh, a whole array of things that uh, were the perfect shitstorm, basically. And 
uh, some some of my teammates they they ended up you know sticking to the national team and uh, competing at a high level and going to the Olympics. Others went into circus, and I decided to pursue um, a completely different path, which was action sports and uh, going to college and university, which is not something uh, a professional athlete does in Spain. That's not something that really happens there. You either you're an athlete or you go to school and work, but you don't do both. So what was the drive there for you? Was there an end goal or was it curiosity? I've always been curious. I've always been someone who's a dreamer and there's always been this itch in the back of my head for success. And that, that word success is disgusting in many ways, but there are many ways of defining it. And I, I define it as a, uh, uh, the most meaningful state you can live in and uh, is something that is aligned with your beliefs and your values. And the way you execute on those values are basically your principles. And I figured back then that it didn't really matter if I was in gymnastics or wakeboarding or snowboarding or in the lab uh, doing research, if I carried the same values and the same principles uh, throughout my life, I would always feel successful. And that feeling of success is what I just was constantly chasing. And eventually I uh, stopped chasing it as much and just started living it. Um, and that's something that, of course, as I get older and I, I got married and had a kid and all these things, I, uh, I think about more often and I try to enjoy the chaos. Yeah. Do you mind sharing what those principles are? You know, they're, they're kind of uh, constantly changing, but the, the basics are uh, compassion, which is not just compassion towards others, but compassion towards yourself. Um, growth, which uh, simply means progression. And growth uh, doesn't always have to be upward like a plant or a tree. It could also be growth downward, like the roots or out to the sides. And, uh, that's important. And then uh, fluidity, uh, which is being able to adapt to um, different situations, different scenarios. Um, just five minutes before getting on this uh, podcast, actually, I got some news that uh, was pretty tough to hear. And uh, I'm not going to share the specifics of it right now, but it was it was tough to hear. And I, I think if I had heard that maybe three, four years ago, I would have reacted and would have been flipping out and potentially even had a hard time talking to you right now. But within 30 seconds of hearing it, I was um, uh, not, not necessarily accepting, but more just uh, okay with what is because it's completely out of my control. And all I can focus is on is on what I can control and what I have right now and to continue doing what I'm doing really well, because if I do that, everything else will unfold alongside me in a way that potentially uh, will end up in a place of harmony, of fluidity, of growth, and compassion. Are there ways that you, you go about cultivating that practice on a daily basis? Yeah, I, I, I guess that's what people call mindfulness or awareness. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. This morning, I woke up pretty tired. Yesterday, I had a pretty hard day of work, and uh, I've been pushing really hard. And there's, you know, when you push really hard, and you're just like, oh, my goodness, I just, I just want one little victory, right? Uh, and usually when that happens, it's, it's when you have uh, uh, mis- uh, guided yourself in defining the victories <laughs> and uh, uh, just becoming aware of that it is important and this morning I woke up and uh, I was having some coffee and I, I pulled up my social media and I started doing the typical like let me scroll through here and I started realizing I went through one post I was like dumb I went through another post stupid and then I caught myself immediately <laughs> judging you know these posts and realizing okay Carl and, these people are not the problem. You're the problem. What's going on? And it was simply uh, becoming aware of the voice and uh, the, what you're thinking and what's coming up 
uh, in you with your feelings and, and then being able to address what is it that you need right now? Oh, well, maybe you need to connect. Uh, maybe you need to uh, take some time off or rest. Maybe you, whatever it is you need, you need to identify that. And once you identify the need, now you immediately feel a sense of peace. And that's what I feel right now. And it's, it's, it's really refreshing. Have you followed a regimen to practice with that? Has there been anything that's like, um, I don't know, TM or anything like that that you've kind of gone, this is the course, this is the structure that I'm going down, or has it been something that you've like cultivated in a different way? Yeah, so actually my, my relationship with TM, so Transcendental Meditation, uh, when I was going through some very hard times uh, three, four years ago, uh, I was having uh, a hard time just living uh with myself i was i was actually borderline i would say depressed and i tried meditation i I followed a bunch of different programs and eventually someone recommended go go try tm and i did that and i realized that uh when i was doing the mantra and all this stuff that that wasn't my style of of meditating and I realized that my style of meditating changes. It goes from as simple as taking a breath and being aware of it to uh, just looking out the window and being quiet and uh, letting whatever I, I'm looking at just be. Um, it could be going in uh, to the gym and training, going for a run. Uh, it's just a matter of realizing what is right now and that's been the practice and so i guess it's it's been an evolution but it's uh it always comes back to being present in this very moment feeling what is happening in this very moment and then uh allowing your thoughts to evolve around that is that feeling something you had when you were competing yes i just wasn't aware that that is what was going on I was instinctually uh, doing it, but I wasn't consciously uh, allowing that to happen. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Um, do you mind sharing, I don't necessarily want you to go into specifics if you're uncomfortable doing so, but what happened three or four years ago to kind of, to bring you to bring you like kind of back to who you felt you were or was there any uh, changing point around there? Yeah, I've talked about this uh, a little bit in, in different podcasts and, and different uh, outlets. Um, what ended up happening was I grew in uh, popularity, business, uh, understanding and knowledge really quickly. And alongside that growth, uh, I attracted uh, different people and companies and opportunities that I had willingly, of course, said yes to because I was just, you know, I was going for it. And I woke up one day and I, I, I realized I'm not really happy. Uh, I'm not satisfied with these relationships. And when I, I tried to pursue change within them, uh, the the common denominator was people saying, well, if you don't like it, don't look at it. And I thought, is that my life? Is, is that how my life is going to go? I'm, I'm going to do something that I don't like uh, in exchange for something that uh, on paper may seem amazing or uh, it will give me more power and control over others. Uh, it, it just, it didn't make sense to me. It just was never the end goal. So I, I started making a pretty drastic change. I, I separated from my, my business partner at the time. I, uh, I started uh, finishing up my contracts and not re-signing uh, the contracts. And in addition to that, I had just uh, finished my book and uh, the, the book became a New York Times bestseller. And which was awesome, but I was totally burnt out because everything I had done to get where I was um, at the core was the right thing, or or at least it felt so. But outside, it just wasn't aligned. It didn't feel like it was. 
I was really showcasing my true intent. So that became hard. And uh, then I, I also became a foster parent around that time uh, alongside my wife. And, and then we adopted. And uh, this was a, a girl that was in her teens. And she, she was awesome. But we were just not equipped to, to become foster parents. And I started to question myself at a level that uh, I didn't think was possible. And uh, as hard as those, those times were, uh, it allowed me to start this process of really unraveling who I am and what I'm doing here and how movement or gymnastics or CrossFit or whatever it is that I, I do and people uh, find me through uh, is just a vehicle to be able to carry uh, a message that is, you too can do it. You too are worth uh, whatever it is you want to be worth. And uh, you're not alone. I'm here with you. We're, we're together in this. And we should be excited and appreciative for what we have and let's, let's do something. Do you mind me asking what you mean by questioning yourself? Yeah. Um, I, I felt like I wasn't worth um, anything. My, 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 who cares? Who cares about Carl? For what? You don't, you don't even have to be here. You can just die. You you have no purpose on this planet. Anyone can do what you do. You're completely replaceable. That kind of questioning. So why 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 even wake up? Why even uh, try to push forward to try to grow? Why try to work on yourself? Just just call it a day. Be done. And then what? change to the the progression out of that well eventually things got so dark that i was i was physically impaired i my body just was not working it was hurting i was tired i uh i tried all kinds of different things um and then i went on this trip for work and i was extremely sick on this plane ride, a 12 hour plane ride to Argentina, throwing up just awful. Um, and I woke up one night in, in the middle of the night, uh, and, uh, I was just having a major panic attack. And my instinct was I need to call my parents right now. So I called my parents and, and they were in Sweden at the time. And thankfully they answered and I got to talking to, uh, my parents and, all I could say was, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I was just so grateful for uh, them giving me a life and supporting me growing up and uh, always being there as pillars. Uh, and it was that moment where I just um, expressed my, my uh, gratitude towards them that, I began to be grateful for myself. And that was uh, the big change. That was when I started taking a deeper breath and I just felt uh, almost liberated from this, this pressure. And I remember coming home back to San Francisco here in California, in the U.S., and waking up one morning and, uh, and hearing the voices in my head of, you suck fuck you, just lie in bed, you're worthless. And then my own consciousness kind of replying back and, and saying, who are you talking about? Because everything that you are saying, that those voices, the, the, the way you're valuing who I really am is not true. My body is amazing and my mind is incredible and I'm so thankful I have this. And... I just said, see you later. I, I, I don't need you here. And I got up that day and things started to change. And uh, I started working with what I had. And it was uh, 
the information that I had gathered over years, which was knowledge. And then uh, where I found excitement was bringing that knowledge, whether it was about a handstand or anything, and putting it into context, whether it was in uh, talking about footwear and apparel uh, that I do with strike movement now, or uh, talking about um, a sports league that I do with workforce athletics right now, or uh, creating uh, the next evolution of my teaching, which uh, is is all about allowing people to to be themselves and to find how their strengths can continue to push the things that they have in their head, where, whether they find that clarity or not. Uh, and I've kind of been um, given a second opportunity and that's actually one of the reasons I'm talking to you. I'm excited to have these conversations. Nice. Um, do you, this is uh, maybe a slightly obtuse question, but you, do you consider yourself either artistic or an artist in, in the work that you do? Because I find that the, the there's, there's a correlation between the people who have some sort of internal conflict and some sort of contradiction in in their potential and their beliefs um expressing it artistically Mm -hmm. yeah uh you know my my mom when we moved to spain she she left everything her friends uh here in the u.s and we moved to Spain, which uh, in 1986 was definitely considered almost a third world country. Uh, she had nothing. She barely spoke the language. Uh, and she was the mother of four kids at the time. Now there are five of us. Uh, she, she found peace in painting. Uh, and she started painting. And this became her thing. And she has become an amazing artist. So, yes, artistry is there. And it's something that I've witnessed uh, since I was a kid, especially while while going through struggle. And I think the way I express myself is definitely uh, artistic, um, whether that can be defined or not. So, yeah, I think there's artistry to everyone uh, and then there's an artistic expression, which is the product. And I guess anything that I put out uh, since I became aware of that, if we had to put a date on that, that would be July 2013, has been artistic, yes. Are there any other examples of your mom like showing you that artistic way or, or maybe guiding you? Yeah, uh, before she even started painting, she used to make uh, baskets and rugs and she was very crafty. She still is extremely crafty. Uh, she would always have the kids playing uh, on the ground around her. And what she did, which was so awesome to kind of go back to and listen to now, is she would have a tape recorder and she would record us as we were playing. So. Uh, as an adult, going back and listening to these tapes, it's very interesting to hear, for example, her making the rug and the wood hitting and um, uh, hearing her make the basket or just painting and hearing those sounds as she is talking to us uh, about something that has nothing to do with the craft that she is currently uh, working on. That That kind of um, subconscious, uh, indirect teaching uh, is the foundation of, of who I am right now. Uh, and I believe you and I, as we're speaking, we are recording this session. And, and this is something that will live forever beyond our time, whether people get access to it in 200 years or not. And that's pretty cool. And I think that is affecting everyone in an indirect way, whether we realize that or not. Now, I'm so glad you mentioned the future um, because where did, where did fly, uh, flying in personal planes in the future come from? Where'd that interest come from? Um, 
you know, there's some, there's something about transportation that is really important to me, which is having access. And there's so many ways of having access to uh, things and, or places or thoughts or understanding, whatever you want to call it, things we'll call it for right now, that when it comes to transportation, think about going from your bed to the bathroom, from your bathroom to uh, work. And the more effective and efficient you are at this act of locomotion, the more access you have. And as I have evolved and grown and worked on connecting with more and more people, technology has been an amazing transportation device. You and I are speaking right now over this thing, and uh, that's amazing. But we are physical beings. And as physical beings that live in a physical world, what does our physical expression look like? And I believe that right now the most uh, advanced uh, form of transportation is uh, flying. Now, when you fly, uh, <laughs> especially when you're flying economy uh, to Sydney for 17 hours, you, you can get a little tired and beat up. And it, and it messes you up, especially when you fly across time zones and you eat bad food on the plane uh, or not as healthy food as you, you could be eating, uh, it messes you up. So there's something about, it's almost like, I don't like using this term, but democratizing transportation that I think could be extremely powerful for humankind. Uh, it's like when you hear os astronauts that have uh, been put up in orbit and they look down and they realize that there are no borders between countries uh, and it doesn't matter where they come from, what their belief system is, what they know about anything. When they come back, uh, there's a sense of uh, renewed understanding and of uh, being more proactive and less reactive, uh, being more responsive uh, to what is happening and just slightly more conscious. Mm. It reminds me of um, almost that that feeling of the Japanese word yugen, uh, like the the like overwhelm of the the enormity of the universe, but the in interconnectedness of it at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on on one of the messages I sent, you were described as one of the kindest pe uh, people in the world. Um, where did that that kindness come from, and where did the listening come from? Fear, 100% uh, fear. As a kid, I was extremely scared of everything. And I was uh, so scared. I was mean. I was, I was quote unquote, uh, I could be a, labeled the bad kid, you know. I, I hit my mom. I, I said really awful things to her. I hit my siblings. Uh, I avoided, avoided everything and anything. Um, just to run away from this inner fear I had. And, and thankfully, uh, my, my parents and my siblings had extreme compassion towards me. Uh, and I was always accepted and welcomed. And there, as I grew, there, there was a change that started happening. And specifically my brother Oscar, who's my young brother, he was able to show me that uh, it's okay to uh, not be number one or, or to put yourself in, in a little bit of risk. As long as you are aware of that and you're doing your best to enjoy what is, um, things will get a little better. And if you practice that every day, it, it will become a strength. This fear will become uh, your strength and you can use it uh, for good for yourself and for others. And uh, yeah, that's something that happened when I was probably 12, 13, uh, that big transition. Um, and I've continued to exercise that uh, as much as possible. And it's been interesting because it, it, it does cause um, 
hardship for other people when you um, are of a certain uh, degree of integrity, it can get confusing for others around you. So, yeah, it's been based off of fear and um, it's been hard. Uh, but I think that's where it stems from. And uh, it continues to be a battle and a struggle. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, if I'm kind, I'm glad people perceive me that way. Put it that way. I, I shit myself daily because I'm also very judgmental. Like like, uh, anyone is, I try to see past the judgment though. Okay. Okay. Do you have any examples of when that, um, when it's become difficult to, uh, to, to have that, that listening, that, that fear that you talked about, you, you mentioned it can be confusing for others occasionally. Yeah. Um, right now, for example, we have, uh, a very divisive United States uh, it's a, it's a divi- divisive s- state of mind that we all have. And it's, uh, it comes from many different places and, and this is not new to our generation, but it's very present at the moment. And, uh, no matter what outlet you go and, and read your, your news, uh, on you, you hear people's opinions. And a lot of times when you hear people's opinions and, um, it doesn't align with what you currently know and understand. It, it immediately creates a reaction. And uh, some of us, when we react, we say, well, F, F that, that, that's wrong. And then maybe we want to type something or we want to say something or we want to punch someone, <laughs> whatever it may be. So it's, it's being able to uh, hold your horses for a second. And when this thing, this feeling comes up to sit with it just for one breath, one second, one minute, and let it pass you by and then make the observation of what it is that you're actually seeing or witnessing and how can you be... Uh, an active, a proactive participant in what you are seeing, whether that means moving towards the action, away from the action, uh, or just remaining neutral. And in conversation, when that comes to conversation with an athlete, what are you listening for? Uh, I'm always listening for needs. Uh, Most, most, uh, most, Athletes are expressing their wants uh, in the CrossFit world. I want to go to the CrossFit Games. I want to have a muscle up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to be ripped out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have my splits. Uh, okay, great. The wants are, are the pictures, the codes that we create in our head. The needs are really the the met feelings, the feelings of satisfaction and meaning. And that's what I'm listening for. And my job as a, as a coach when it comes to physical education is to, to show you how your wants are simply targets that allow you to set a trend. And right now in your current state and the way that you express yourself in this moment actually contains all of the feelings that you are hoping to get when you arrive at the want. And that's my, my job. That's the artistry of, of coaching and teaching. It's bringing context to Mm -hmm. who you are in this very moment. And, And that's a very challenging thing to do. But if you, if you listen, look, feel, are you, you can make uh, that possible. You can make that a reality. Are there certain needs that you look out for? For example, um, whether you take 
take a take a resource like Maslow's hierarchy of needs or the way that Tony Robbins, for example, has kind of reframed those and put them into significance and certainty and variety and, and type things like that. Are you, are you looking out for certain needs that are more prevalent in athletes or is each one kind of individual? Everyone's individual. Uh, I mean, Tony Robbins, he, I think he has six needs. Maybe he's added a seventh one. Uh, and I guess the average number of needs that's out there, I think they, they say is nine. And I couldn't tell you what they are exactly off the top of my head because everyone expresses their needs different, uh, regardless of the discipline, whether it's an economy, sociology, psychology, <laughs> sport. Um, so it's, it's translating the, the need. If it's a need for connection, well, then here we are. You and I are talking and we're having a conversation and I'm here with you. I'm going to be 100% present and uh, aware of what you're saying. Uh, do you have a, a, a need to contribute? Well, guess what? I'm going to show you how you can do that right now uh, or, or as soon as we're done with our session. Uh, so it, it's being able to read in between the line and I think it's just being aware of what it is that they're seeking to feel and how can we um, develop or create or suggest strategies uh, around those feelings um, and to create those feelings or to at least allow for those feelings to come, come out. Nice. Um, to take a big left turn, where did B, mm-hmm. uh, where did B-Boy come into it? So uh, when I was doing gymnastics, there uh, were b-boys that would come in and train at our gym. So I would watch them and I remember uh, judging them and thinking, <laughs> look at that, poor quality gymnastics, <laughs> those fools, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then one day I ended up uh, going with them to a park that was right by this train station. And I remember them like, pledging the floor just cleaning the floor making it really slippery and then they had these beanies and they were practicing head spins and i thought well you know what uh, i'm gonna try this thing and and i i remember trying it. i was like oh that hurts a lot and then i thought well i'll try a windmill and then that hurt my back and i was like oh this is stupid you know break dancing yeah breaking your body this is dumb Fast forward uh, 10 years, 15 years, I was in San Francisco and um, a guy that was working at uh, a gym that I was coaching at uh, called Acro Sports here in San Francisco uh, that went by the name of B-Boy Wicket. Uh, his name is actually Gabriel Chico. He was uh, uh, practicing there and I, I had no clue really who he was, uh, but I was uh, technically his manager. So I would, you know, fill out his, uh, his time card and, and make sure he got paid and ran his hours and whatnot. And we kind of became friends. And, and one day he said, I have this event in Korea. Uh, it's a big breakdancing event. Uh, I don't know if you would like to come with me, but it would be awesome for you to see what we do. So I said, sure. Uh, that would be interesting. And, and the excuse was that I was coaching, quote unquote, the, the team. I was, I was their physical trainer. And uh, anyways, I, I did some training with them and then I flew out to Korea. And when I arrived there, all of a sudden, I realized that this b-boy thing was way bigger than I thought. And um, I remember they did a an introduction, uh, like a U.S. presentation demo, uh, just a showcase battle uh, on this stage. And when Wicket, as the leader, went out, uh, I was mind blown. I'd never seen anything like it. The music was on point. His moves to the music were on point. The way he was engaging with the audience was on point. The way he was connecting back to his team was on point. The camera would come in and he would work with the camera. And I started thinking, what is this thing? And the way that they were moving was completely different than anything I'd ever seen because it wasn't the gymnastics power moves it was the dancing, the actual physical expression of who you are in relationship to everyone and everything that's around you. And I just thought that was fascinating. And then I started meeting the different characters in the scene. And I just thought to myself, 
how have I missed this? How have I not seen this? And I started practicing uh, with, with Wicket. And I remember my first practice with him, which he basically, he didn't force me to go to, but he was like, let me just show you this thing. Uh, we did a little session and I remember getting in my car after the session and I, I just turned on the radio and there was some pop song or some, something was playing on the radio. Some, some song that I probably would have never really stopped to listen to. And the music was coming out in 3d. It was just the most surreal experience. I could hear every layer of the music. I could see movement within it. I could, I could feel the music and it was just such a fascinating thing to realize that break dancing uh, could be such a powerful bridge between what's inside of us, who our physical bodies are in this world and how we can express it uh, through movement. And that, that was, that was how I got into it. And then where did that take you off that? I started practicing and what I realized is that where people at the time when I was practicing needed most of my attention and brain power and focus was in the CrossFit space at the time, where it took me was to translating the principles of movement that breakdancing was teaching to CrossFit. And that's when uh, this notion of freestyle really started to solidify in my in my head and in my practice and it was at that time uh, when I found breakdancing and really started understanding it that I started realizing that I was unhappy with what I was doing and that was all in July 2013. That's interesting it all, it all comes together at the same time it comes yeah. together. Um, yeah. I think it's a uh, it's a good time to touch on freestyle because it was like, I know, I know I said this to you when we spoke before, but I think not, I'll take the word think out there. It was one of the books that completely changed the way I saw coaching. Um, it was one of the first books to really talk about principles instead of what, um, instead of to give a prescription, it was, a uh, this is, this is how you came about the thought. This is like, this is the principles behind there. And there's, there's lines in there that really, really just embedded themselves into me. Like the goal is to chase the best way, not the most familiar way, like things like that. That was, um, that honestly completely changed the way I, I trained and coached others. So what was the the process of writing that like and getting what was a, a principle based belief out onto paper? And then I don't know what's happening with design as well, but, um, if we start with the, the writing process, what was that like? Yeah. The, First of all, as you were saying that, my, my arms were kind of tingling uh, and my heart rate started to kind of elevate. And, I have that effect uh, on men. That's the way I do it. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Man, uh, I appreciate that. It's, I guess this is part of being an artist, right? Uh, I feel very misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, and I feel like there's a huge gap between what's in my head and what I feel and how people perceive me. So to the book's point, starting to write the book was one of the hardest things uh, I've ever done. And I'm super thankful for the opportunity because I wasn't ready to write the book. But at the time, I was, um, I was working around Kelly Starrett uh, with Mobility Wad, physical therapist at San Francisco CrossFit, and he had uh, gotten a, a book deal. And uh, we were taking some pictures for his book, and he, he told his co-author, Glenn Cordoza, who's with uh, Victory Belt, the publishing house, he told him, you need to give Carl a contract. He has a lot of information, uh, and he, he needs to write a book on, on gymnastics. And... After that, thanks to Kelly, I, I got this book deal. And uh, the publishing house gave me the contract. I signed the contract and they said, all right, start writing. And in uh, nine months, we'll, we'll ask you for the manuscript. And I said, all right. So I got, I got started and I was like, oh my goodness, I have no clue what I'm doing. So at the time, I, I, uh, I reached out to one of my clients who, who's a neuroscientist uh, and he was working at um, uh, 
at Stanford University at the time. He, he had just graduated from his PhD. He was uh, crushing it. And one of the things that we had talked about was writing articles together uh, about movement and how neuroscience could explain movement in, uh, in a different way uh, and maybe you know, facilitate some understanding uh, in different fields of science. And I said, look, I, I got the opportunity to write this book. Uh, I can have a co-author. Are you down to write this with me? He said, yeah. So he basically came in and became uh, my, my coach through the process of getting the information out. And we wrote and wrote and wrote. Nine months went by. We did not have the manuscript. We, we got a, a, an extension. Another nine months went by. Uh, I didn't. Uh, finish it uh, and then eventually I told him look I, I can't write about gymnastics it just it's not it's not who I am it's not what I do and they're like well write about CrossFit and I was like well CrossFit is not who I am either and eventually I was about to just call it a day and uh, uh, my co-author Tony he came up to San Francisco from Stanford Palo Alto and he said uh, Carl screw the book let's write a manual right now uh, or actually what we said was, let's create an app for your seminar. So let's write for the people that you're talking to uh, daily. And I was like, duh, that only took us <laughs> three years to figure out. And that night we started writing around 3.30 and we finished at 1 a.m. We did not stop writing the whole time. And we crushed an outline and we created a rough draft of the whole book within one day. And we presented that as the manuscript and they said, yes, this is it. Go for it. And then we, we just got to it. And for eight months, we just filled out the outline, challenged everything, made sure that we were sticking to very basic principles and that the information was simple, clear, and compelling like my uh, – business coach would say tom tom reed who's actually coming out with a great book soon called task i can't wait to share that um it was it, it, it was an amazing process and i remember writing the the last two words pass it on it's just like pass this on and when i wrote that i felt an immediate sense of relief like oh yeah i can forget I can almost allow myself to forget all this and a whole new uh, space opened up in my mind. So it was, it was the most interesting thought process that I've ever gone through and as liberating as it was, just by having to put something on paper, it is also um, limiting. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and once again, it comes back to this beauty of the struggle of this is the hardest thing you'll ever do, but if you allow yourself to do it, uh, it will be the best and easiest thing that you ever do. I love the way you said, allow yourself to do it rather than force yourself to do it. It's just let it come out. Um, mm -hmm. So am I right in thinking that you're re-releasing it and you've re-released -re it and like going through a, a different process? What, what was the thought process behind that? Uh, the, 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 the new book that I'm working mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Yeah, the, the thought process was uh, I reached out to my, my community on social media. I said, hey, are there any writers out there? And uh, I ended up connecting with several people. And, and this one guy basically came up to me and said, look, we just need to make this thing a very simple uh, uh, book that people can just hold on to and put in their back pocket and that is not your phd this is the the book that uh you you will see it um at the airport you'll want to pick it up you'll open it as you're sitting on the plane and immediately as you're sitting on the plane you're going to want to get up and try something uh and it, it uh, it's almost like your self-coaching manual uh, or catalyst or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I haven't gotten uh, into the 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 sales uh, <laughs> literacy uh, of it yet, but it's it's a very simplified version of what freestyle is, and it's for people like my mom, my dad, people who know nothing about. 
uh, physical education or training, uh, but also for those who do know to be able to express it in a more simple way and a maybe more fun way and uh, a more goofy artistic way. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's where, where we're at right now. And uh, we're working on just, you know, massaging this into the final product. And then what's the direction with that? What's, where's Carl going to be in two, three years time? In two, three years time, I think, um, I will probably be directing, producing, and writing uh, a feature film. That's one of my goals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I want to release a couple more books. I uh, want to continue to do more public speaking. I want to connect with more people. Um, I will have uh, uh, gotten a little closer to solidifying my investment portfolio and uh, my alignment with uh, different companies and brands, whether uh, acting as, as an investor, ambassador, founder, uh, and developing a, a, a network of um, micro systems and ecosystems that can interact with one another and, and create a place where as many people as possible can have access to information that will turn into knowledge that they can apply and, and, and create understanding. And the way I want to do that is through an experience. And the experience is ultimately going to be designed, whether it's putting on a pair of strike movement shoes or playing in a basketball league uh, with workforce athletics or uh, trying uh, some, some restaurant and talking to a chef, what, whatever it may be, uh, it will allow for people to uh, jump on board with the transition we're seeing of going from an information era to a conceptual era, a concept era, where less information uh, connected the right way can allow you to see more and therefore be more of who you already are. Elegance. Hello. Um, how do you approach goal setting? Do you have, like, because you seem, to, like you've mentioned, you have your principles, and how do you, like, do you think this is just a thing that I want to achieve, like just being a, a needless word there, this is a thing that I want to achieve, and it's going to serve that, that that principle that philosophy or do you look at your philosophies and think how am i going to get there or is it just is it a almost like a whim that you you chase or like how how does that how's that come about it's a great question um we we all we all see hear feel things that are attractive to us uh and when we feel attracted to something uh at, at first i just thought oh i'm just interested in this but what I came to realize that was that any time I saw something attractive in someone or something, it was a reflection of what I didn't realize I felt attracted to in, in myself. So uh, I allow myself, once again using the allow, to pursue the things that I feel attracted to. And within the things I feel attracted to, let's say it's transportation, find uh, expressions of, of that that I can um, enjoy daily. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's uh, riding a bike. I like to ride my bike to the gym. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And then as I'm riding my bike to the gym, I may see an opportunity to uh, develop some sort of product around this to make my experience a little bit more uh, enhanced or uh, whatever it may be, make it more efficient, effective. And, and that's where I pursue my goal setting. And that's why if uh, I say, hey, I want to write, produce and direct a movie is because I'm very attracted to film. And I'm very attractive to uh, telling a story. Do I know what the story is? Not yet, but I'm, get, you know, but I'm getting there. So I set the, set the goal as I'm very attracted to going to space, going to the moon, going to whatever, making a movie, creating something. Now, 
how can I do that right now? What is my current expression of that? And I start writing about it. I start practicing it. And that leads to me seeing more and uh, being able to uh, make decisions daily that, that get me closer to that uh, thing I was attracted to, whether I end up going there or not. Nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. I love it. Um, yeah. Right at the beginning, you mentioned, or like, or very close to the beginning, you mentioned in some way, I think the quote was, in, in some ways, success is disgusting. Mm-hmm. Um, what does success mean to you? And like to, to shamelessly steal a, a question from Tim Ferriss, who's the first person you think of when you hear the word successful? I just thought of my dad and then I thought of my mom. And the reason I think I thought of my dad was because I, I, my dad has been a very successful parent to me. Okay. What, what does that look like? Uh, just rock solid, just always there, uh, whether he was physically present or not, uh, always uh, instilling uh, values and uh, staying consistent to that and allowing himself to show emotion uh, in front of us and then rectifying if uh, he, he felt like he had to rectify and yeah, just solid fucking dude uh, that I look up to and worked his ass off to uh, allow for me to have the freedom to work my ass off and do the same. Uh, so I think I think of my dad, and I do also think of uh, of my mom, of course, because without my mom, uh, yeah, I would. I would be a goner. Uh, so, so my parents are, are number one for sure. That's, that's success. I'm alive. That's success. Do you say you'd be a goner because she wouldn't have got you to pursue what you're good at or like, is there, what else is there? I don't think, I don't think we're good at anything or bad at anything. Um, I, I think all we have is who we are. That's all we have. And, uh, all my parents did was they created, for lack of better words, a safe space for me to unfold. That's all it was. And just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I remember reaching out to them because I needed, I needed their help. I could have asked someone else for help, but I, I asked them for help. And uh, it was tough for me to ask them for help. But uh, as I as I did, I, I realized, wow, this is this is what we've worked on for the past thirty six years, and here we are, we're we're doing it. It's how cool is that? That's that's success, in my opinion. I, that is a successful relationship, and um, if I can create one percent of that, then I'm doing it. You know, it's uh, that's that's how I feel. Nice. And um, what about, I've got so many things I want to touch on. Um, what about mentors? Um, who's, who's mentored you? And that's had, that's an unofficial role or an official role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had, I've had many mentors. Um, believe it or not, as, as you're speaking to me right now, uh, you're, let's, let's call it, if we had to label it, you're like a micro mentor, uh, a temporary mentor right now, just as you're speaking to me by asking me questions, you are uh, allowing me to go places in my mind and recall certain aspects of uh, who I am and express them in a very uh, precise way right now in this format. So, so you are a mentor right now. Um, but I've had many mentors. I had uh, my, my gymnastics coach. He definitely stands out. I remember at a younger age at school, I had a, a teacher that was a mentor. He, he, would, he would be a teacher beyond the classroom where um, if I needed any assistance outside, like uh, extra curricular uh, assistance in terms of learning, I remember his wife would come over to, to our house and she would tutor me and uh, – with a couple of friends, they would take us out on, on little lunch, dinner dates, and we would just have a good time. And he was a mentor for sure. 
and to be able to still have a relationship with, with them now is, is, is awesome to look back at. Um, yeah. And then when I entered, uh, kind of the CrossFit space, uh, of course, Kelly Starrett was a big mentor to me. Um, and, and that, although the relationship was bittersweet, it was complicated, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, he, he allowed for me to be a superstar within his world and to um, learn part of the language that he spoke as a physical therapist and his creative application. He, he is extremely intellectual uh, when it comes to understanding concepts. Uh, he, he's a conceptual guy that it, it, that's his super, super skill. And then he's creative to, uh, create unique expressions that are signature movements of his. Uh, so he was a, a big mentor to me. And then, uh, B-Boy Wicket and, and break dancing was a big mentor. My, my wife, Tanya has been a huge mentor to me. She, she's the one that's allowed me to, uh, also start to speak this language, uh, which is a more uh, compassionate expression of, of who I am. Uh, my my business coach Tom Reed has been a mentor to me. Uh, I see Logan Gelbrick with Deuce Gym in Venice, California, as a mentor to me uh, when it comes to uh, leadership. Uh, my daughter Tanai has been a mentor to me in terms of understanding. Uh, and, and reminding myself of the kid that's inside of me. Uh, yeah, I, I, could, I guess I could go on for days. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a, a common trait of people who make an impact on other people, seeing everything as a mentorship opportunity. Um, you've, mm -hmm. you've got two choices. You can ignore it or you can go, oh, that's, that's useful in some way. Um, mm -hmm. we, we spoke before we even started recording about um, the first two and a half hours of your day. What does that look like? Yeah, I usually uh, get up, uh, make myself some coffee. I, I take a seat at the kitchen table, and sometimes I just sit there. Uh, sometimes I read. Sometimes I listen to a podcast or to some music. Um, and most of the times what I'm doing is I'm, I'm writing, uh, always handwriting. I, I, I don't like to type. In fact, I'm terrible at typing. Um, so handwriting, and I just have a bunch of just little notebooks everywhere of ideas, thoughts, drawings. Uh, and I just start unraveling whatever thoughts I have in my head. Sometimes I go down the rabbit hole and I go crazy, and sometimes it's just one word. An example is uh, if you uh, uh, go to my Instagram stories, for example, I, I tend to share a lot of the stuff that I've written about in the morning. I tend to share that on, on stories throughout the day. Uh, yesterday, for example, I, I wrote uh, an effective formula for communication. And it was very simple. It was kind of like, oh, one, uh, make an observation, literal observation. Two, express what you're feeling when uh, you make the observation. Three, uh, realize what need is being met or not being met. And then four, if you want to make change, uh, request a change in behavior or action and to be explicit. So it's simple things like that. Uh, that lead to solidifying the principles like we talked about and solidifying uh, taking what we know, whether that's how to do a muscle up on the rings and translating that to photography, film, um, uh, carpentry, <laughs> communication, whatever it may be. And I think that's um, what I spend my first two and a half hours of the, of the day doing. And what about the last, how do you, how do you wrap up a day? Um, lately I've been also writing a little bit more, maybe just 10, 15 minutes. And maybe I, 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 uh, exercise revisiting some goals. If I had some specific goals or, uh, things I'm grateful for, or some wins of the day, I actually tried this new journal called the best self journal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's been actually really good to find structure with that with that journal uh i'm usually not that kind of guy but uh this one has been really good and it's 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 been kind of like a game you know to go back yep. and look at my calendar and oh look at the wins and look how great i am this is it's a good little uh pep talk for myself 
Okay. Yeah, so that's usually how I finish. But um, I'll, I'll give you another example of things I like to do. I love to just lie on the couch, click on the TV, and uh, get YouTube rolling. Mm-hmm. And I start going down the, the yeah, uh, uh, physics has been something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Okay, what, what kind of physics? Uh, astrophysics, yeah, specifically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? Uh, so it's just. Uh, I think. I think the the curiosity of what's beyond the blue sky that we see mm-hmm. is extremely powerful, and it's out there. So why shouldn't I care? Yeah. The, yeah. That kind of thing. And um, yeah, knowing that there's a language to understand it, I, I would like to speak a little bit of that language, whether it's uh, being fluent or, or just pick up some sound bites that I may recognize. Nice, nice. Um, and just to, to kind of finish up, because I've heard you speak about movement as a language before, and I think it's a beautiful metaphor. Um, so like, how do, you, how do you feel about that? And, and what, what do you mean by movement as a language? Yeah, when, when it comes to movement, um, we don't need to use words to understand each other. Mm-hmm. You can smile and I, I will know that you're, you're happy or you're feeling positive about something. You can cry and you don't have to say anything and I can see that you're crying, that you're maybe sad or you can even cry of ecstasy, right? And you're, you're crying of joy. Uh, that's what movement really is. And the beauty of all these different disciplines and methods is that when you study them within these disciplines, you will find um, these universal truths that when you overlap them with other disciplines and styles and ways of uh, moving your body in space, uh, they are the same. And that union that connection is where you um start to feel uh like you're not alone like what you're thinking and what you're doing it's real and it's acceptable and it's powerful and meaningful and who knows maybe it can make a positive change if you keep poking at it and you keep practicing it I think that's that's the main reason I talk about movement as a language. It's a very basic form of communication. Nice. Um, this has been one of the most inspiring podcasts I've done. So thank you like so much for your time, Carl. Tell people where thank they can you. find a bit more about you and like the upcoming projects, the book, and your website and things things like that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for being uh, a source of uh, just a place for me to express myself. I, I, I'm I very grateful for that. Um, and yeah, if you want to find me, if you want to check in with me, uh, hit me up on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, uh, Carl Powley, you'll find me there. And uh, I'm happy to, to hear from you. So feel free to message me. Um, I'm currently working on relaunching my site, freestyleconnection.com, which I'm super excited about because I'm going to be able to share the things that I'm really interested in. And I think some people may be surprised with things that I share. Uh, they will come a little bit uh, unexpected, but maybe after this, this podcast, uh, it won't be so surprising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is, uh, we're currently, I'm saying this out loud for the first time, launching it December 4th. Uh, we're going to start simple and then we're going to rev the engines up. So yeah, that's where you can find me. And then on YouTube, of course I'm there and, uh, yeah, look out for seminars or events, uh, nearby you and come say hi. I would love to love to meet you. Cool. Um, I can't wait for you to be back in London again. I was, uh, unfortunately in Barcelona that weekend, but we'll, we'll make it work at some point. Oh man. For sure, dude. Thank you so much again, Tom. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thanks, dude.
Thanks for listening to another episode of the Mindset RX series of the Alpha Movement Podcast. Remember to check out that blog at mindsetrx.com slash blog slash the arch to find out how to attack any and every word your box or competition can throw at you. And secondly, head over to iTunes, leave a five-star review, help more people find the show. And I shall see you very soon for another episode of the Mindset RX series of the Alpha Movement Podcast. Mm-hmm.